Hello there, Internet. I am Ikenbond of Lux and Hemlock, and this is a book review for uh, Narcissus and Goldman by Herman Hess. And uh, I've been trying to do this as I finish uh, a book that I think is really worth noteworthy. Uh, I wanted to kind of talk about it while I'm still like really cognizant of some of the details and just really kind of explore it and think about it. Um, and this one, this one was really good. It was really good. I love Herman Hesse. He's uh, one of my favorite writers. Um, Siddhartha is one of my favorite books. And I I think this is better than Siddhartha, um, but in, in a very different kind of way. Um, like Siddhartha is, it's, it's just so good. But um, Narcissus and Goldman, um, Siddhar Siddhartha leaves you with this kind of hope, uh, with this with this idea, like it's this spiritual conquest, this, you know, like going into the mystic and really coming out of it with lessons learned from it. And I feel like Narcissus and Goldman is the exact opposite. It is a book that does not offer any kind of revelation. There's no, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. By the time you get to the ending to Narcissus and Goldman, you, all that you're really left with are these questions of, these characters, um, and it's really hard to talk about this this book. I've been kind of like playing it over in my mind. I finished it today, and I read the last like hundred pages all in one sitting. And I'm glad that I did that because I had been reading most of the book kind of in about twenty five to fifty pages, um, at most, kind of in, in small segments, like sort of piecing the the book together. But to get the to get the ending all in one kind of final sweep really felt good. And the ending, uh, the ending um, leaves you with this, I, I'm not going to say hopelessness, I'm not going to say like this despair, but like this disquiet, this like real disquiet of the soul. Um, and it really asks these questions about, you know, what is life? What it, how are we, how are we meant to be living it? And these two characters that the book is named after, Narcissus and Goldman. Narcissus is really on kind of the bookends of, of of the story itself. He He's there in the beginning of the story, and then he's there at the end. But the book really follows the exploration and the life of Goldman. And I think it's because so few of us could ever live a life like Goldman lives. Uh, he's a wayfarer, a traveler. He leaves a monastery at a very young age and goes off into what is essentially medieval Germany um, in the, the decade before the Black Plague happens. And he is just traveling from town to town. He meets strangers. He meets you know, men who try to rob him. That he like is forced to kill and then survive through the wilderness until he meets the next town shed. He's a lover of women, um, kind of almost a womanizer in many ways. Uh, and uh, he just... He becomes an artist, and when I say an artist, I'm I'm not talking about like our our idea of the artist, but the way that Narciss talks about what an artist is, and Narciss kind of takes that there are two essentially in his mind there are three different types of people. There are the scholars, the thinkers, the the people who uh, can think without imagining. And those are the scholars. And he uses a, a very easy example to understand whenever in the last chapters of the book where he talks about like arithmetic and writing and mathematics. Where, like, yes, you can't imagine the symbols in your mind when you're doing a mathematical equation. But uh, the, these are just representational of, like, the thinking that is going on. And he expresses that this, this is a very high form of thinking. That this is, and he's, he's an abbot of a monastery. Uh, or becomes an abbot of a monastery. And so, like, the mind is where he lives. He reveres people like Aristotle and St. Thomas, St. Thomas, and, uh, like, his expression of the universe and his whole, like, drive in the world is to know more, that, like, godliness is uh, the mind, that it is that, that area of the world. And Goldman is perceived to be the exact opposite when he... Uh, unleashes Goldman on his quest. Uh, 
when Goldwyn goes on his quest, Narcissus is, you know, saying that, you know, you, by the time you end this, what you will have learned is just how different we are, um, is one of his quotes. You know, like your your whole like your whole life is basically just going to be to prove just how different we are. But both of them are going for the same goal, which um, is this nebulous idea of truth and understanding of oneself. And so Goldman does the opposite. He spends his entire life, wastes his years, his youth, uh, traveling around the world, sleeping with different women, going to different cities. Like he he goes through. Uh, you know, he's traveling through the world like when the Black Plague hits and is seeing the horror and the devastation is caused by it. But he becomes an artist. And again, in, in the way that Narcissus pre like, precitates this, the difference between a scholar and an artist is that the scholar thinks without imagining and the artist imagines without thinking. And what that is supposed to intone from Narcissus' perspective is that... Uh, Goldman is able to create images of his own mind. He can create these fabrications of the world. Like it doesn't have to have sense. It doesn't have to have reason. It just has to be beautiful, and it has to like it tells its own sort of story. And there's a third like component of this. There's the scholar, there is the artist, and then there is the mystic. And the mystic is this kind of in between. This like homogen like the worst half of both and the mystic is the the kind of person that he like distinctly disdains um this person who can be uh, a thinker and a scholar that they can both have the mind of the higher power the god the godhead the the, the great eternity the the all mother the 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 mother eve that goldman is searching and have kind of this logic like they are kind of predisposed towards uh, contradiction, which is what this book is really all about, is these contradictions. Um, but Goldman, being the artist, being the, the person who can imagine without thinking, proves to Narciss in the final chapters that that is not true. And that um, I feel, and like I, I've looked at some reviews for this book, and I feel like I haven't seen anyone else kind of express what I felt in this, but I feel like Goldman teaches Narciss that he's wrong. That Narciss is kind of this, like his name even kind of implies it in a way. I have to think that it's about, you know, Narcissus, uh, that he's he's kind of self-centered. He believes himself to be kind of indomitable. Like his, his thoughts and his mind are so much wider. He knows people so well, like uh, to the point where um, in the very beginning of the book, like, again, we don't get much of Narciss because his story is not that interesting to talk about. But in the very beginning, the abbot who Narciss will eventually replace, that we'll find out much later in the book, you know, thinks that Narciss is so arrogant um, that he that he knows too much in a way. And I feel like it's so subtle. I feel like if you're reading the book, you would you would so easily lose track of these details unless you kind of read it all in one setting. But Father Daniel, who is the abbot before Narciss will secede him uh, several times over. Um, you know, thinks of Narciss as being this, like, being too arrogant. And so when Narciss sends Goldman out on his quest to seek his mother, uh, he doesn't know what he's unleashing. And he, he certainly doesn't believe that Goldman is going to come back with something greater than what he has already predisposed because he is so knowledgeable and so worldly and has so much knowledge of Greek letters and arithmetic and writing and mathematics. But in, in his darkest hour, Goldman finds Narciss again. And Narciss saves him from a predicament um, and brings him back to the monastery that he had grew, grown up in and gives him a workshop and sets him to work as an artist. But what he learns in that moment, when, when Goldman begins to express his art from all the things that he's been longing to create and long to mean, um, he creates these artworks. And... I think, and, and again, I've, I've looked up reviews of this book, and I haven't found anyone really talking about this, but I think in that moment, Narciss becomes aware of the fact that Goldman has become the mystic, uh, become both of them together, has become, has understood the logic and the reason of the universe, and knows the how to imagine without thinking. 
And in that way, in the way that only the artist can, he creates these sculptures. Uh, they resemble figures from their youth. Like one of them in one of these sculptures near the end is Father Daniel. One of them is another friar that was part of the monastery they were part of. One of them is a woman that he loved. Uh, they're beautiful sculptures. Like, you know, they're intricately carved. They're, they're beautiful. They resemble the human beings they're supposed to be. But more than that, they hold it within themselves a cadence of life and emotion and feeling that just by looking at them, Narcissus realizes that they have all this intention. That yes, you can have these imagine, you can imagine and think. Uh, you, you don't, you can't, you, it doesn't have to be one or the other. You don't have to imagine and not think, or you think and not imagine. The scholar and artist, as he creates that separation in his mind, but Goldman becomes the mystic. He becomes the true mystic where he brings both of these together and shows that like through his art, he is able to combine what one is thinking of and what like what one is imagining. And there there is this very strong thing of duality. Like from the very beginning, Narcissus and Goldman are said to be these sort of dual natures. Like they're they are the same kindred soul. They, they have the same desires. They want the same things, except that they, they, cannot, they cannot do it the same way. Goldman cannot stay in the, in the monastery, and Narcissus can't leave it. Um, he's a pious, you know, a self-reflective individual, someone who's lost kind of in the clouds, in his own imaginings, and like imagining the will and the, and the grace of God. And Goldman has to go into the wild earth and has to experience all the revelry of life and all of the... The, the tortures and anguish and ecstasy that comes with that. He suffers so much, and both of them are so horribly lonely. Um, Goldman's wonderful with women. He's, you know, he's immaculate with women. He absolutely can play them like a lute. You know, he he knows their, their slightest gesture. He can woo them without, practically without even trying. Um, you know, he just, he has them in that way. Uh, but none of them ever want to stay with Goldman. None of them ever want to be with him. They want to lay with him. They want to spend time with him. Sometimes they even love him, but none of them can stay with him because his nature is so ephemeral. It's so like beyond their grasp. It's so like no, like not mortal in a way. Like he's an evanescent like angel that is sort of slipping through their their grasp at all times. And he comes as a vagrant and a wanderer, and so like he. He, he doesn't, he cannot sit still. He can't stay in the city. He can't be betrothed. Um, and so it, it makes sense that the, these individuals that he runs into, they're often married or et cetera. But in the same instance, and, and again, Narcissus is the bookends on this. You only get the beginning and you only get the end with him. But Narcissus is the kind of person that is so like withdrawn from the world. So like, like pulled away from it that when that he realizes at the end of this this saga that the only person the only person he has ever loved is Goldman and I'm not that's not romantic like I, I don't believe the book is ever meant to be interpreted as romantic though I will say it's you could definitely take it that way there's a couple of lines in particular that I think don't hold up but even if you did interpret it as romantic it wouldn't change anything um, but. Goldman is the only person that he can love because he is the only equal that he sees. And only in their later years before, before the end um, can Narcissus admit these things, admit that you know, like he becomes afraid. There, there's a moment in the end where, uh, where Goldman is sort of finishing his projects and Goldman decides that he's going to go back into the world. He's going to go retrace his steps a little bit. He's, he has to go out there and live because that's just who he is. He doesn't want to become his master Nicholas. Um, but when he leaves during that time, Narcissus is afraid. He's deathly afraid. He's afraid that he will never see Golden again. And in that moment, that's when he begins to question for the first time that maybe this is not the way, uh, this is not the way. Um, that all of the striving that he's done so far, all of the actions he's taken in his life, that he's made a mistake, that there is something very beautiful about and this is a religious book, you know, it, it deals with things like Christianity and the idea of sin. And so like thinking that, 
you know, maybe we are put onto this world to sin and to live, especially after things like the Black Plague and after the, these moments that, like, maybe, like, maybe being so pious and and being here and and devoting myself to mathematics and knowledge and thinking has robbed me of what is truly human. Um, and so he begins to really long for Goldwyn. He begins to really, really hurt for the fact that his the only true love of his life, the only person that he considered an equal is is no longer there but goldman does return not for very long uh, goldman does return to the monastery and uh, spends his last days there with narciss and we we see this transformation of him he's become so much older uh i won't try not to spoil some of the details but he becomes so much older and uh he vanishes from the world and where he began life as a as a monk and where he survived some of his early encounters through his his doctrine and through like his belief in Christianity and uh, in God, like after all that he's seen and watched out in the world, at the end of his at the at the end of this story, um, Goldman is at best a pagan, but at at worst an a, an atheist, and doesn't believe in any more higher powers that it can't be. Like after all that he's seen and done, and 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 just transpired in the world he doesn't believe that it could be possible that if at least if it is if it is real if there is a god that the world is badly made um and on his on his deathbed uh goldman uh expresses something really interesting he's he has been traveling like he was sent out on this quest because of narciss narciss told like revealed the secret longing of his heart when he was young that he did not know his mother and he conjured the image of his mother in in goldman's mind and so throughout the book you get these like flashes these insights where goldman sees what he kind of calls like the universal mother the 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 all like the, the the eve of all and she is a thing of contradiction uh she is you know the kind of like brooding oh like exemplified entity that is above life and death that it is both agony and sorrow there's moments where like he sees a woman who is like giving birth for the first time and he you know like painstakingly like remembers how her face is both like it shows an ecstasy the same kind of ecstasy they had seen in love with other women but also the this agony and how there is this duality to life, like how is there is this um, this unprecedented, like both sorrow and joy and evil and good and right and wrong, and how there's life and death and decay and bloom, um, and so he has been chasing this, like this image. He becomes an image carver. He eventually becomes, you know, a, a real true artist in the sense that we know it. And is able to start carving these images um, and becomes very fixated with drawing and, and creating things. Uh, but he's he's holding on to this one, this one insight, this one thing that he wants to carve out of the the all mother. Um, and which is essentially his mother, which is both life and is both death. It's the reason he's on this journey, and it's eventually what will kill him. Um, and you struggle with this duality, especially when you're going to the parts in like the Black Plague, where like he is seeing the absolute worst of humanity, the very worst that could possibly produce this, you know, frenzy, this zeal, this destruction, like towns completely laid bare, gates open, giant pits where bodies are being thrown into and burned, and then finding some beautiful young woman and stealing her away uh, until and until horrible things happen. And so it's it's they're both they're both such lonely figures but the way that the book is book ended on narciss uh there's a moment in in the death of goldman where uh, it's literally the very last page and it's something that like in every review that i went through on this book no one talked about and again i talked about like narciss begins to doubt while goldman is away that like he has not lived his best life and again, that Goldman's becoming the mystic, the the in between, uh, no longer the scholar, no longer the artist, but the mystic. And you know, he the only person that he's ever loved. He returns and he's dying, and 
he's in this situation and his last words in what is essentially the, the last pages of the book, um, you know, he expresses his, his belief in the, in the all mother and this duality, this crushing duality. And his, his last words are essentially, you know, uh, the mother that I always saw it is the one who is now carving out my heart. She is, she is life and she is death. And then he turns to Narcissus and says, but you have no mother. How will you die, Narcissus? And the last sentence of the book, the very last sentence of the book, is that Narcissus is terrified by this quote. He is terrified by what Goldman has said. And that's the last sentence. There's no resolution. You don't find out what happens to Narcissus after this moment. After his his best friend, the, the only person he's ever loved, has died, you don't find out what happens to this abbot after this moment. All you know is that in that moment, in that moment when Goldman, his only contemporary, his only equal, passes away and his last sentence is how you die, uh, he is terrified. And I don't know what to make of that. I, I've been struggling all day since I finished this this morning, read 100 pages, got to the end, and like, I don't know why Narcissus is so terrified of this. Um, I don't know why that is the last sentence of the book. I don't. I don't understand it. And I'm not. No one. No one that I found, as far as the reviews that I've seen for this book, has talked about how how frightening that is. How disquieting it is for the soul. And there's a part of me that thinks that you know I'm not. I'm not so certain about Goldman being the have reaching the middle, have being become truly the mystic. Uh, there's, there's part of me that really feels that like they really are meant to be this like very distinct duality and that there is no do there is no middle ground for them. And that it's a story about how both of these lives miss something that both of them lead to suffering, that both of them end in despair and that, and, and just like every other life that happens in the world, it, it is, it is lacking the, the omniscience, the the majesty of the whatever higher power, whatever you want to call it, whether it's God or the universe or whatever, that it, that you're you're missing the eagle eye view of why all this happens and what it's supposed to all mean, and you know, like I said, it, it's disquieting. It's a disquieting of the soul. It, it it left me not feeling sad. I didn't feel sad. I felt just discontent like there was no revelation there was no ray of light on the end there was no final word that put it all into place it was just like imperfect it was all just the, the two imperfect lives that surrounded one another and was embraced by one another and was conjured by one another's actions but that didn't answer the fundamental questions of life because that question doesn't ever really get answered. And in that way, I feel like this book is just amazing. That is like it, it proposes those questions. It proposes that want and that need to, for life to have reason to have meaning, but it doesn't offer anything. It doesn't try to be, to stand on its own and, and give you some revelation. You know, it is just saying there, there's, there is beauty and there is horror. But what you make of it, it's not that it, it not that it's even ultimately up to you. Just that, like you'll never understand it, no matter what kind of person you are in this world. Whether you are the scholar, you are the artist, you will never understand it, uh, because there's no there's no one avenue and there is no road that leads to the answers to these questions. These are the eternal questions. They they are stronger and bigger and more thoughtful than you will ever be. And you will spend your whole life, you could waste it away like Goldman. You could, you know, burn it up and grow older before your time. Or you could be pensive and thoughtful and very, very carefully curate every thought and very every, every action like Narcissus. And you still will not ever reach the answers to these questions because they are so much bigger than you. Because you are so small in the in the grand scheme of things, um, and the little questions that you have are are, are not worthy of being answered. Um, 
or at least the, the it wouldn't be a life worth living if they were answered. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. And um, I, I think that last sentences in that la those last passages are just so harrowing because they don't offer any kind of absolution from those questions. They just offer disquiet and discontent with the state of things and with the lives that we live. And I think a lot of us could say that we are narcissists or a lot of us could say that we are living. I feel like few of us could say that we're Goldman, especially the Goldman that we get at the end of the book. But uh, even if you were Goldman, it's, you would learn anything more than if you were someone like Narciss or if you were like the pig headed people that Goldman hates throughout his entire travels, um, because there are no answers there. They're, you cannot unravel this mystery. Uh, and no matter what kind of person you might be, the artist or the scholar, it's just, it's beyond you. And I suppose that's, that's how I feel about this book. Um, I thought it was really good. I think it's my, my favorite Herman Hess novel. I think it's better than Siddhartha, uh, because it is so nebulous and so vague and it doesn't, it doesn't try to, it doesn't try to answer anything. It just tries to make you think about it. Um, or at least to experience it through, you know, through a fiction. But anyway, um, I am Eichmann of Lux and Hemlock, and this was a book review for Narcissus and Goldman.